it is plausible to argue that scalp DHT levels might take longer to reflect these changes compared to prostate tissue DHT levels. Also, might I remind you the men in the study, quote, effect of dutastride on intraprostatic androgen levels in men with benign prostatic hyperplasia or prostate cancer, unquote, by Roger Rittmaster, and colleagues have prostate tissue cells that have been altered as they had either BPH or prostate cancer. The scalp and prostate have different physiological environments and enzyme activities. For instance, the expression and activity of 5-alpha reductus, the enzyme responsible for converting testosterone to DHT, varies between these tissues. This enzyme exists in two isoforms, type 1 and type 2, which have different distributions and activity levels in the scalp and prostate. We can get a quick and better understanding by referring to this paper titled, quote, Medical Aspects of the Treatment of Lower Urinary Tract, Symptoms, Benign Prostatic Hyperplasia, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, unquote, by Jamie A. Cavallo and Stephen A. Kaplan. In the context of benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer, the physiological environment and enzyme activities in the prostate are notably different from those in the scalp and normal prostate tissue. Jami A. Cavallo and Stephen A. Kaplan summarizes that the enzyme 5 alpha reductase exists in two isoforms with distinct distributions and functions in various tissues. In the prostate, 5-alpha reductase type 2 is more abundant and predominantly expressed in the cytosol of stromal and basal prostate cells. In contrast, 5-alpha reductase type 1 is primarily found in the nucleus of prostate epithelial cells. This differential expression plays a critical role in the pathophysiology of benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer. In benign prostatic hyperplasia, there is an overexpression of both 5-alpha reductase type 2 and type 1 with a higher concentration of type 2. This overexpression is associated with the proliferation of benign smooth muscle and epithelial cells within the prostatic transition zone, contributing to the disease's clinical manifestations. In prostate cancer cells, however, there is increased expression of 5-alpha reductase type 1 and decreased expression of type 2 compared to benign and benign prostatic hyperplasia cells. This variation in enzyme expression is particularly pronounced in high-grade localized prostate cancer, where both isoforms are elevated compared to low-grade cancer. Dutastroid's pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics allow it to effectively target these overexpressed enzymes. Dutastride has a high affinity for both 5-alpha reductase types 1 and 2, enabling it to efficiently reduce DHT levels in the prostate. The overexpression of these enzymes in benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer tissues creates an environment where dutastride can be rapidly absorbed and exert its effects more efficiently compared to normal prostate tissue or the scalp. This rapid absorption and effectiveness in reducing intraprostatic DHT levels can be attributed to the drug's ability to bind strongly to the abundant enzyme targets present in these pathological conditions. So in other words, we can't say this reduction in DHT levels would be similar across all tissues, especially in the scalp. That would be inappropriate. Unless we get better studies on the matter, I would argue that changes in the scalp tissue DHT environment would take longer than the changes in prostate tissue, especially prostate tissue that has cancer or benign prostatic hyperplasia. And I just want to note this. While a reduction in serum DHT can suggest that treatments like finasteride or dutasteride are having an effect, it's important to understand that this doesn't fully reflect the reduction of DHT within tissues where these drugs are primarily intended to act. This discrepancy arises because these medications target the enzyme 5 alpha reductase specifically in tissues that are rich in this enzyme, such as the prostate and hair follicles. The primary action of these drugs is to prevent the conversion of testosterone to DHT right at the site where this process normally happens, which significantly impacts tissue DHT levels, but may not correspondingly influence serum DHT levels to the same extent. The serum contains only a small fraction of the body's total DHT, as well as a lower concentration of circulating 5-alpha reductase enzymes compared to that which is in the tissues, like the skin and prostate. Circulating levels of DHT are observed to be one-tenth and one-twentieth. Those of testosterone in terms of total 
and free concentrations, according to Bassin S. book titled, quote, Pharmacology, Biology, and Clinical Applications of Androgens, Current Status, and Future Prospects, respectively, unquote, on page 72, whereas DHT levels in the skin may be up to 10 times those of testosterone in tissues with high 5-alpha reductase expression, such as the prostate gland and skin tissues, as noted in by Hay and Wass's 2009 excerpt in Clinical Endocrine Oncology on page 37. Therefore, serum measurements can underestimate the drug's efficacy in tissues, where DHT's reduction is crucial for therapeutic outcomes. For example, in treating conditions like prostate enlargement or androgenetic alopecia, the critical factor is the extent of DHT inhibition within the prostate or the scalp, respectively, rather than in the bloodstream. This localized reduction in DHT can lead to the desired effects, such as decreased prostate size or slowed hair loss, even if serum levels of DHT show only modest decreases. Also, serum DHT is mostly bound to sex hormone binding globulin, also called SHBG, when in the bloodstream. SHBG helps modulate sex hormone levels in men and women by binding to androgens and estrogens. This makes a particular ratio of these hormones inactive at any given point. When they are inactive, these hormones can't readily be used in metabolic processes unless something happens to remove SHBG from them, according to Ronald S. Swerdloff and colleagues in their paper titled, quote, Dihydrotestosterone Biochemistry, Physiology, and Clinical Implications of Elevated Blood Levels, unquote. This makes the DHT in serum largely inactive. This means it can't do much to either grow your prostate, grow your muscles, or finally mess up your hair follicles. Once again, we are only concerned about DHT in the tissues because that's where it is mostly produced, not in the blood. Additionally, the dynamics of DHT production and regulation vary between different tissues, influenced by factors like local enzyme concentration, tissue-specific expression, and the presence of other cofactors affecting enzyme activity. This complexity means that even if a drug effectively reduces DHT levels in one type of tissue, such as the prostate, its impact on other tissues, and by extension on serum levels, might be less pronounced. Hence, while a decrease in serum DHT is a positive sign that finasteride or dutasteride are working, the true measure of effectiveness, particularly for localized conditions, is better assessed by considering the reduction of DHT within the target tissues themselves. One potential argument I can think of would be based on the difference in blood flow and tissue permeability between the scalp and prostate, I would argue, and I could be wrong here, but a key factor is the difference in vascularization between the scalp and the prostate. This could explain why DHT levels in the prostate drop more rapidly following oral dutasteride administration, at least what we know about in men with BPH and prostate cancer cells. The scalp's blood supply, while rich, is more diffusely distributed and involves a more intricate network of capillaries. The scalp receives blood from multiple branches of the external carotid artery, providing extensive coverage to the skin and hair follicles. This diffuse nature of blood flow might contribute to a slower and more complex process for drugs like dutasteride to reach and maintain effective concentrations within scalp tissues. In contrast, the prostate's blood supply is more direct and concentrated. The prostate receives blood primarily from the inferior vesicle arteries, with venous drainage through the prostatic venous plexus, which efficiently supplies the organ with nutrients and drugs. This structured vascularization might allow dutasteride to achieve and maintain therapeutic levels more rapidly and consistently in the prostate compared to the scalp. When reading the Merck Pharmaceutical Company manual website, the article titled Drug Distribution to Tissues by PharmD Jennifer Lam states that the rate at which a drug enters a tissue is influenced by blood flow to the tissue, tissue mass, and the partition characteristics between blood and tissue. Distribution equilibrium where the rates of drug entry and exit are equal is reached more quickly in richly vascularized areas unless membrane diffusion is the limiting step. Membrane diffusion is the process by which molecules move from an area of higher concentration 
to an area of lower concentration across a cell membrane. The prostate, especially when enlarged due to benign prostatic hyperplasia or affected by prostate cancer, generally has a more extensive vascular network compared to the scalp. Also, the concentration of blood flow to the tissue is much more compact. With the anatomy of the scalp, keep in mind, although it is fairly vascularized, the blood flow is spread throughout the scalp with many vessels and a more intricate network of capillaries. This would make a drug like dutastride fairly diffuse throughout the scalp tissue. This means that drugs like dutastride are more rapidly absorbed and distributed in the prostate tissue than in the scalp. The relatively high blood flow in the prostate ensures quicker delivery and a higher concentration of the drug in the tissue, leading to more efficient suppression of DHT levels. Of course, this is just my research and understanding. If you have a different opinion, I would welcome the discussion. So with all this in mind, it makes sense why investigators in the Olson et al. study would wait 12 weeks and 24 weeks for their checkpoint assessment on things like hair count and scalp DHT. I don't think with the present evidence that we can conclude that scalp DHT levels would drop similarly to prostate tissue DHT levels in the same time period. Also, serum reductions in DHT is not the same as tissue as DHT is a paracrine hormone, and levels in the tissue are way higher and much more compact than in the blood and or serum.